Hi, I'm Dr. Joshua Sappenfield, and I'm going to do a basic overview of the 2014 American Cardiolog College of Cardiologists, American Heart Association's Guidelines on Perioperative Cardiovascular Evaluation and Management of Patients Undergoing Non-Cardiac Surgery. And this is what I think you should know for your rotation. At first, this is, looks pretty daunting and overwhelming. That's really straightforward, and we'll go through this by step by step. So first, if you have a patient that's scheduled surgery that has known risk factors for coronary uh, artery disease, and it says C sections 2.2, 2.4, and 2.5 in the full text. And we'll kind of briefly go over that real quick, but you should actually read that further uh, for, your, for your own sake and for what you should know for taking care of patients. And so if the patient's gonna have emergency surgery, you can do what you can with those risk factors, uh, but then you proceed with surgery. So 2.2 is heart failure. Now we're gonna go over history, physical exam, and ancillary story, studies that might be important. And 2.4 is valvular heart disease. Uh, there's class one, class 2A, and class 2B evidence in case uh, practice guidelines. Then we'll briefly talk about arrhythmias and conduction disorders. Now keep in mind that if these are elective cases we're talking about and they have these risk factors, you should probably get cardiology involved uh, so they can give recommendations perioperatively. So every patient uh, that comes in, you should probably get a history of whether they have had heart failure in the past, uh, whether they've had fluid in the lungs for, for pulmonary edema, whether they had orthopnea, that's where they get shore breath with laying flat, or whether they've had paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and that's a sensation of shortness of breath that awakens the patient often after one or two hours of sleep. It is usually relieved by being in the upright position. Shortness of breath of exertion is also important. A physical exam, these patients might have bilateral rowels or, or crackles as a sign of uh, decompensation. They also might have a third heart sound gallop. And that actually is possibly predictive of uh, decompensate heart uh, failure. Things that you would see on answer studies is if you had a chest x-ray, this is where you get uh, prominent vasculature or vascular redistribution, which might be one of your um, like red flags, this patient might be further evaluated. Uh, and then signs on echo. And on echo, you have uh, preserved dejection fraction, heart failure, and you have uh, diastolic dysfunction um, with preserved ejection fraction. Valvular heart disease. Class one uh, recommendations is if they have a moderate valvular disease, that they should have an echo every one to two out years to follow up with them, or an echo for any time they have a change in signs and symptoms. Uh, if they have a known history of moderate um, uh, valvular heart disease, uh, it is indicated to perform uh, echo prior to elective surgeries. Class 2A, that in asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, mitral uh, regurgitation, and aortic insufficiency, you proceed with surgery. And class 2B, uh, you may proceed uh, in asymptomatic patients with severe mitral stenosis. Uh, and given this is with appropriate hematomatic monitoring and such, uh, I'll refer you back to the guidelines uh, for more specifics. And lastly, uh, arrhythmias and conductive disorders. And they go over the ones that are significant and the ones that aren't. And the insignificant ones, they had asymptomatic conductive disorders, such as ventricular couplets or non-sustained ventricular tachycardias. If a patient has long-standing atrial fibrillation or long-standing right or left bundle branch blocks. And so again, these are all people with asymptomatic uh, with no symptoms regarding their uh, arrhythmias. Ones that are definitely significant are new, sustained, or non-sustained ventricular tachycardias, are complete 
H A A V nodal block. And so those are uh, patients that you would be concerned about. And for all of your rhythms and, and conduction disorders, you should be checking for um, uh, doing a tox screen, looking for intoxicants that might be contributing. Uh, is your patient um, coming down off cocaine or such, uh, leading them to having ventricular tachycardia? Uh, you should be looking for electrolyte disorders that make the uh, rhythmias more likely, and you should be looking for metabolic uh, issues. And, and you do have to rule out what these patients are having ongoing ischemia. which is what my, my tag here says. Now, if the surgery is not emergent, you proceed to assess whether they have acute coronary syndrome. And if they do, you evaluate and treat according gold directed phenyl therapy. And so essentially, this is where you will be getting cardiology consult. Uh, and for your, your oral board exams, you need to know exactly why you're getting your, um, your consult what studies you would need uh, for the consult to be effective, and, and what you expect the consult, consultant to do with the information you provide them with. And so after you undergo uh, goal-directed medical therapy for your acute coronary syndrome, or if they don't have it, you proceed to assess their perioperative risk. And so one of the things that is recommended is the revised cardiac risk index. It's a six-factor index for their risk of major adverse coronary events uh, during surgery or cardiovascular events, more than one confers greater than 1% risk. Um, I like using MD Calc to, to remind me what the revised risk cardiac index factors are, uh, but they've updated and the new update uh, it has to be broken. There's no way that it works with this algorithm. But the risk factors is high-risk surgery, intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, or supraingual, and that's open intraperitoneal, intrathoracic, or supraingual. Does not uh, include um, uh, laparoscopic or uh, VATS or, or those kinds of things. But open surgeries, history of ischemic heart disease history of congestive heart failure, history of stroke or TIAs, um, diabetes requiring insulin, and then a preoperative creatinine of greater than two. And so if you have more than one of these risk factors, you have greater than 1% risk of uh, MACE, this procedure. What's probably better to be used for your patients than this is the NISQIP calculator. And you find it by putting NISQIP, N-S-Q-I-P in Google, it's the second thing that comes up, the ACS risk calculator. And this is what it looks like. At the top, you put your procedure in. You can either put uh, a description of what it is or the CPT code, because uh, all this is based on the CPT code. And then you enter the following factors, age group, gender, functional status, is the emergency case or not, ASA class, steroid use, ascites. And essentially, this is based on at least 20,000 cases in the United States and what their risk is of having issues during surgery, as opposed to the original revised cardiac risk index was only based on 4,000 patients in the Chicago area. And this is what your printoff would be. Uh, and for this made up patient I have, this patient has a serious complication risk of 4.3%, which is greater than the average risk for the surgery I picked. Um, but the risk of cardiac complication is the fourth line down is 0.5%. And so that would be less than 1%. And so if your risk of major uh, adverse cardiovascular risks events is less than 1%, you go to step four. It's elevated risk, you go further on down the algorithm. And so low risk, less than 1% risk of MACE, no further testing, class three evidence, um, proceed with surgery. And for you that uh, don't understand what class three evidence, just a refresher, class three evidence uses um, wording like it is not recommended, is not indicated, should not be done, is not useful, effective or beneficial, 
uh, in this case, further testing may be harmful to your patient. However, if there's elevated risk, so greater than 1% risk of MACE, you need to assess the patient's functional status. And there's three options here, uh, 10 METs, uh, four to 10 METs are less than four or unknown. And so, uh, and the guidelines are recommends using the Duke Activity Scale Index. And so, the Duke Activity Scale Index is uh, a 10 factor index that uh, includes a variety of things, which we'll go through here in a second. Uh, the only caveat I want to put in there is the one that talks about golf. Golf is not riding around in your golf cart um, and playing golf. It is walking the halls and carrying your own golf bag. And so the indices is, are you able to take care of yourself? Can you eat, dress, bathe, and use the toilet by yourself? Are you able to walk indoors? Can you walk one to two blocks on level ground? Can you climb a fly of stairs? And in Florida, we don't have any of those. And so can you walk up a hill? Are you able to run a short distance? Are you able to do light work around the house, such as dusting or washing dishes? Can you do moderate work around the house? Are you able to vacuum, sweep floors, carry in groceries? Can you do heavy work at the house, such as scrubbing floors, lifting or moving heavy furniture? Can you do yard work, such as raking leaves, weeding, pushing a lawnmower? Are you able to have sexual relations with your significant other? Are you able to participate in moderate recreational activities, such as golf, uh, once again, carrying your bag and walking the course, bowling, dancing, doubles, tennis, throwing a baseball or football, or you can participate in strenuous sports. And so all these have a factor associated with it that they have a formula for to calculate how many METs of activity you're able to generate. And then so if you can do all of them, you can do 10 METs of activity. So according to this algorithm, if you can do 10 METs of activity, no further testing is needed. Class 2 evidence, proceed with surgery. Once again, a reminder what the recommendations look like for 2A evidence, it means it's reasonable, can be useful, effective, or beneficial, is probably recommended or indicated. And so in this case, all your patients that can do 10 minutes activity is probably recommended or indicated. Proceed with surgery uh, based on a cardiac risk standpoint um, with no further testing. Then we get down to the moderate or, or good category. If they can do four to 10 minutes, if you score a no with any of those things on the index, you're at least uh, four or 10 vets or worse than that. And it says no further testing, proceed with surgery, class 2B evidence. And so this is where your clinical judgment in. The majority of your patients that you have cancellations over or issues with are gonna follow in this category. And so just a reminder, class 2B evidence means it may or might be considered it may or might be reasonable. Usefulness, effectiveness is unknown, unclear, uncertain, or not well established. And so proceeding surgery may or might be reasonable. Usefulness, effectiveness is once again unknown, unclear, uncertain whether doing further testing is necessary. And so these are the patients you really need to look at. Is there anything further that we can optimize these patients for? Is there really anything else that you would want to take care of this patient uh, since it's not perfect, the DASI score and your, your base, uh, that you could further lessen your patient's risk of um, having MACE during surgery, or at least be more aware of what the real risk is in your patient? So if they have poor or unknown functional capacity, the guidelines actually state that you should proceed with pharmacologic stress testing. Once again, class 2A evidence. Should is probably reasonable, uh, that kind of language. And then however you look at it, um, whether it's unknown capacity or you get the pharmacologic stress testing, um, you follow the clinical plastic guideline, uh, practice guidelines, and there is evidence to go ahead and proceed with surgery if, if no appropriate or better alternatives exist. And that proceed, that's the end of my talk about the guidelines.